thank you for joining us. So we've got an hour to discuss a very big issue. Uh, so I won't waste too much time uh, in, in cracking on. We've got a fantastic panel who I will inter invite to introduce themselves in just a second. Um, I guess a bit of context for this. Um, so my name's uh, Peter Lefort. I work for Cornwall Council uh, on their carbon neutral Cornwall programme. So uh, Cornwall Council declared a climate emergency in January uh, of last year. Um, and in many ways, uh, we consider ourselves and are considered within the local authority world to be uh, ahead of the curve in some ways. Um, but what that doesn't really say is, is whose curve is that? Who's drawing that curve and where does that curve lead? Because if you look at any other curves written by scientists or people uh, potentially in the global south, we are well behind, uh, as are all local authorities in the, in the UK, of, of the curves we need to be. Uh, we need to be following in terms of the action that needs to be taken uh, urgently. So within this idea of a climate emergency declaration, there's a lot uh, to unravel. Uh, these, these declarations can tend to ignore what's happened to get councils to that point, and they can also uh, potentially uh, ignore what is supposed to happen after a declaration uh, and sometimes um, not necessarily lead to the action that they are designed to encourage. So we're going to grapple a bit with that and some other issues around what a climate emergency response on a, on a local scale means, but also potentially looking at the uh, national and international uh, context of this. Uh, it'd be really great to have some uh, some questions from anybody who wants to feed in. Uh, you can do that in the chat box or, or later on in, in the in the hour, we'll be looking at whether if you want to join and, um, uh, and share your, your audio and video and ask a question that way. Um, without further ado, though, I'm going to invite our wonderful panel to introduce themselves. So I'll work around my screen uh, and start off uh, with Lizzie. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so my name's Lizzie Boyle. I am a town councillor in Froome in Somerset. Um, I will go on repeatedly about how wonderful Froome is um, and that you should all come and visit when you get the opportunity. Um, we as a town council declared climate emergency in December 2018 um, and we've gone through quite a process since then which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a little while. Um, uh, by day, my day job is in sustainability and environmental consulting. Um, and I'm also a director of Froome Renewable Energy Cooperative, which is the local community energy company in our area. Thank you. Um, over to you, Matt. Sure. Thanks, Peter. And hello, everyone. So, yeah, I'm Matt Rooney. I work at a consultancy called Anthesis. We're a sustainability consultancy. Uh, and I lead our work supporting uh, local authorities and cities in the UK. Uh, following the development of a emissions modelling tool called Scatter, which I helped to lead back in a long time ago now, back in 2017, um, which uh, I guess to um, use Peter your your phrase, it it, it offers uh, another curve, I guess, to to compare against the science, and uh, we find it's it's injected a bit of. Uh, realism uh, into into uh, work performed by councils all over the country. So, um, yeah, I guess that's that's me for now. Thank you, uh, Amanda. Uh, hi, really nice to be here. Thanks, Peter. My name is Amanda. I'm in Cornwall as well. Um, I'm a social entrepreneur and consultant and activist, like many people here, lots of hats. Uh, and I'm interested particularly um, in change the psychology of change across social economic and environmental spheres sort of that way and how the collaboration works but also interested in those things at individual and community and institutional level and i'm particularly interested in terms of the psychology of change um, in the role of transgression and rule breaking the sort of thinking differently and challenging paradigms um, and no, Peter, through various iterations of what he's been doing here. So really, really, really delighted to be part of um, these sessions these last few days because they've been incredibly interesting and sort of like a sweetie jar for the head. Excellent. Um, and over to you, Simran. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. My name is Simran Batra and I work at CDP, which is formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. And we're a nonprofit that run a global disclosure platform. So I work with our local authorities in the UK, helping them disclose their climate related data, 
um, kind of supporting them being transparent about the climate actions that they're taking and the progress that they're making on their targets and kind of providing them with guidance and really working closely with Matt and the scatter tool as well. Thank you, everyone. So we've got a fantastic panel here, a uh, really great uh, variety of, of perspectives. Uh, and we've definitely got enough uh, to, to cover an hour just with the, the questions that, that come to, to mind to, to me and, and, and within us. But as I say, if anyone has got any particular questions that you want to, uh, to, to add, please do put them in the chat box and we will get to them uh, as we can. And um, first thing I want to put to all of you, though, um, and be interested in the different perspectives on this is, um, how would you summarize what has happened since council started declaring climate emergencies uh, as lizzie mentioned that started at the end of 2018 is still going on now what progress do you think has been made uh, in in all sorts of different ways and whoever wants to jump in first on that please be my guest well shall i shall i tell the story of what Froomtown council has been up to as a kind of living example and we can kind of go from there and you can tell us if we're where we are on whichever curve we're on um so the declaration of climate emergency was was end of 2018 um it followed quite a long a long history of activity around sustainability and environmental issues in Froome so it wasn't a new subject for council councillors or the council staff to be addressing it was a continuation and an excellent you know an expression of something that was already already well underway. Um, the recognition very early on was that the town council can't do this on its own, can't respond to climate emergency, the climate emergency on its own. Um, and so one of the early steps was to actually say, well, how can we engage other people in this discussion and in shaping what our, our plan is going to be? Um, so late last year, late 2019, we ran a series, the council ran a series of panels. Um, we had hoped to run a citizens assembly, but we couldn't quite make that work in terms of funding and resources. Um, so we, we ran panels, which brought in people who had an interest in a range of topics. We had sessions around energy, transport, and what we loosely called resources, which was sort of everything else, um, really to gather an idea of what people would be interested in, what people would contribute their time and their energies towards, and what people felt were priorities for Froome based on what we knew about the town's carbon footprint um, and, and general carbon footprints, um, sort of nationally and, and locally. Um, following on from that, we were able to shape our climate emergency strategy, which was published um, earlier this year. And we had started to develop for this year a real plan for, OK, how can we increase the amount of resource and capacity that the town council would put into these sorts of projects? And then global pandemic. Um, so a lot of things that we were talking about at that point had to really be put on hold. And, and we had to sort of refocus the, the town council really refocused its effort, re efforts on um, and its energies on um, supporting people in the community that, that really need that immediate emergency support. So now we're sort of regrouping recovering um as part of our green recovery sort of planning we asked the community again you know what do you think are important things that we can take from the lockdown period or that should be priorities and it was very interesting the issues for example around transport cycling walking air quality and also green spaces really came to the fore because those were things that people had really treasured um if you can treasure anything during a, a global pandemic um so we're now at that stage of saying, well, okay, how do we start to put these plans into, into action? Um, and I think that's where a lot of councils are. There's been this sort of declare, strategize, act. And now people are just moving from strategy to act. Um, that's how it sort of feels to me from, from, from where we are. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, Simran or, or Matt, how does that fit with, with what you've seen, I guess, with a slightly um, a broader perspective, looking at, at, at what lots of different councils are doing? Yeah, I think um, it's really great that from that you've like declared a climate emergency and have been working on a climate action plan. I mean, across the country, we've had over 200 local authorities declare climate emergency since the IPCC 1.5 report was released. Um, which is really great because it sort of gave a political commitment that like climate was really a political priority, which wasn't necessarily there before. So um, 
no matter how you're going to argue it, that at least there's some sort of commitment right there. Um, and since then, we've really been seeing that a lot of local authorities have been then scrambling, essentially, to pull the evidence together for what that means. What is their baseline? What does their target mean? Did they set a target to be carbon neutral by 2030? And really trying to grapple with um, essentially the scale of what that really means. And that's where I'm sure Matt can come in. Um, and then since COVID, you know, a lot of those local authorities were developing their climate action plans or had finished or were about to finish um, once COVID really hit. But, you know, the great opportunity has been that many local authorities have been willing to keep climate as a priority through this whole process, that they're really willing to do a green recovery, that they want to and see that as a priority um, and don't want to revert back to business as usual. I think we've spent really the last year right before COVID really educating local authorities about the science and having them really understand, you know, what was at stake. And before COVID hit, we were on track for a three degree, four degree kind of world. Um, so there's an opportunity not to go back to business as usual and actually change the investments, really change how the way we live and work because they've actually seen citizens can really respond to strong behavior change. So it's kind of an opportunity for them to really implement their climate strategies kind of from, from scratch um, and hope that we can actually avoid this three degree world that we were heading towards before all of this. So I think some people are really seeing it as an opportunity to kind of change investment pretty strongly. So hopefully that does happen in the next couple of months. Yeah, and I guess just, just to add, I think, um, I agree that there, there's been that, that process, as Lizzie, you put it, de declare, strategize and, and act. Um, but I, I guess we've, we've seen quite a lot of variance in, in how long it takes to strategize or indeed how long it takes to get that that kind of mandate to to be able to strategize and within that i think simran I'd, I'd include some of the baselining bits that go with that and the evidence gathering that's needed to strategize but uh, that yeah there really has been quite a, a wide spectrum of you know some have declared an emergency and and kind of cracked straight on and and really treated it as, as an emergency whereas others have declared the emergency and actually there's been a lull even even pre-covid there were many that had declared an emergency but didn't really do anything until until um uh, certain you know groups and individuals start holding them to account to say hang on a minute you've declared an emergency why aren't we seeing anything so um yeah that 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 strategized phase i would i would say um there's either been a lag get into that or or the the, the amount of time spent strategizing and, and don't get me wrong it's a very um com complex uh you know matter to to, to to know all the answers to um but but yeah i guess you know the unfortunately there's, there's probably been less in the act stage than than than, than is needed um and if, and of course not everyone has has declared an emergency yet so you know even Councils may be still thinking about that, knowing that there's going to be this process to go through of, OK, you declare, then you need to get resource to, you know, uh, develop a strategy and et cetera, et cetera. I think there's there's just that process is, is it feels like it is it is taking taking its time for, for, for many councils. Um, and, yeah, I think there, there there could be opportunity perhaps to, uh, to, to, to learn from others and, and maybe speed that process up and, and shorten that process now. It'd be interesting to, to explore what that might mean in practice. Um, but um, Manda, with a slightly different perspective, how would you phrase what you what you've seen happen since since council started declaring? You're still on mute. Sorry, how many times has that phrase been said this last year? Um, yeah, some really interesting perspectives uh, from everybody, and I think it's really important to understand that landscape in terms of what's been done and those different paces of change um, and all the different structures that have to be managed in order for that change to happen. I think my perspective, just to add into that, is around um, the how as much as the what and how that change happens and what sort of change we're talking about. So it doesn't, it doesn't feel too uh, mechanistic or instrumentalist. This is about who's involved. And I think words that have come up around accountability and legitimacy are really important. I think Peter um, made a reference to um, 
the importance of understanding what happens before a declaration is declared um, and I suspect it's the same absolutely everywhere um, a colleague of mine said to me after the council had declared so did uh, did that look like just happen like all by itself or you know were they encouraged uh, on the floor and chewed the carpet for me because there is a vast amount of work that goes into I mean Cornwall's a huge council a um, lot of minds to engage with four months of lots and lots and lots of people spending their own time talking to parish council and town councils and neighborhood panels and community groups to encourage that political process to start um, that's the thing that encourages that gives the mandate to a big local authority to make that really big decision and then it's important then for that social capital and energy and citizenship to be included in what happens afterwards and i think one of the things that we've all seen um sort of witnessed and participated in in Cornwall is an understanding that it's actually it's about um a recalibration of uh power dynamics and relationships and roles and a, and a re-understanding of how this is a collective threat that needs a collective endeavor and there are things that a local authority as an institution or an anchor institution um can do and it's really really fantastic that they do take the reins on that and there's things that they can't and there's the stuff that the community, however we want to describe that, other institutions and businesses and community groups and citizens can do and can't do. And the trick is, how do we do that collectively? How do we create a horizontal collaboration? So I think we're still understanding how that works and how we can bring what we've got, understanding that we're all operating in different power times, different restrictions. How do we make the most of all of that, that very um, plural and diverse energy and move forward? Where none of us really know exactly how we're going to do it all and none of us really know how we're going to get there and it can seem quite scary um scary in such a way that some people can feel paralyzed and scary uh, because they are looking at it and scary which means that some people don't look at it at all and have to be dragged and that's tricky for everybody so a lot of this is about psychosocial dynamics and how we figure out afresh how we work together but then the point is that there are lots and lots of conversations happening that are allowing us to find those new ways of working together, which is like gold dust, really. And that's how we know we're going to make the difference. I think we're still making it up as we go along. That's a very short version. <laughs> that's a good uh, uh, for, for all of this work is we're making up. Level that it needs to be leaned into. Um, be interested uh, for those listening along. Um, if, if there's any, if you've got a different perspective from from your local authority, be really interesting to hear that. You know, have, have they declared? Uh, was that a painful experience, or was that was that fairly fairly easy? Um, I think one of the things that's just jumped out to to discuss in the meantime that that came out of there was, I mean, Matt, you talked about time. Uh, and, and the time that, that it takes for people to declare. And, and a few of you mentioned things around consultations and, uh, and, and data baselines, these kind of things. So all of these processes take time. Uh, and when we're looking at the climate emergency, time is obviously a resource that we do not have a lot of. So how do we balance that, that, that kind of tension between the urgency to act, but the need to do it in the right way in terms of the the data and the science, but also what Manda's talking about in terms of the kind of the social aspects of that, of bringing people along with you. So I'd be interested to know how, how any of you have kind of grappled with that tension, you know, urgency versus we need to not leave people behind. Sure, maybe just to, just, just to kick off, I guess for me, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm quite limited in, in terms of obviously there's, there's many aspects to this and you just picking one example, of the baselining and um, in, the, in that area of the what before getting too much into the how, which again, there's there's a whole ton of um, examples there um, that you could talk to. Um, but I, I guess what we're seeing is there's quite a lot of similar things now that um, when you actually look at the actions that are needed, they, they don't vary that much council to council that the current context is, is going to vary in the individuals and human beings that that can enable these things but actually a lot of like the the tech and the process in many cases is is pretty consistent 
So we're, we believe at the moment it, there needs to be a focus on that, on that medium for sharing knowledge. So I love the phrase horizontal collaboration because I, I guess that really could apply at a council, a council level as well as an individual or citizen level. I think there's there's quite a few layers to that, and so yeah, we 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 don't we don't have the you know the the exact answer to this, but yeah, definitely the mediums for collaboration and how tech can enable that, uh, certainly given the current context and how we can we can help different councils or it could be businesses or citizens just try and cut through and 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 get straight to kind of what what does the best practice look like and what are some of those lessons learned what are some of the deep the do's and don'ts how can you just cut through some of that as quickly as possible and yeah i guess we're, we're yeah as i said of the view that i think tech and um yeah tech enablement can really help but yeah interested to hear hear the views of others yeah definitely i think we've seen you know it's what every council has to do is not varyingly different as Matt said you know everyone needs to tackle buildings everyone needs to do transport waste energy and the actions underneath all of those are very similar um but they are spending a lot of time kind of trying to reinvent the wheel and you know what we kind of say is you need enough evidence that it's you know um material to your location to your area that's relevant to your area but it doesn't have to be perfect and i think people kind of get really nervous about data and evidence thinking that it has to be exactly right and it doesn't and i think people you know really struggle with that because we do it is a climate science you know there's scientific evidence behind everything but it just needs to be perfect enough that it's representative of what's happening and then kind of getting on with the actions and learning what to do but not getting so caught up and i think people get nervous to to get to the action part because um i think manda you said like we don't know necessarily how to do it all it does require a huge amount of collaboration with people you know local councils the power that they have is, i think they only control about two to four percent of the emissions within the area so i think that a lot of it is just nerves and you know there's been austerity for years in this country that the teams are really limited there's one or two people in most local councils and now they have this huge power and opportunity to deliver everything. And that's quite nerve wracking for a lot of people. So I find in my role, a lot of it's just counseling people to make them feel okay and not feel so nervous that they have to be the one burdened with trying to figure out how to implement all of this. And it's really trying to have people understand that, you know, their climate action plan actually needs to be embedded with different people, with different people in the city, the council, governments. Um, companies and organizations and people and kind of getting that balance but unfortunately that's not a quick process and that does require um, navigating people and personalities which does take a while can I jump in there Peter uh, yeah absolutely right and I think um, that notion of you know we, ha we have got used to a hierarchical arrangement of the way the world works which is not at all how the world works actually but it's what we how we've made the world work which means that people who apparently have been invested with that feel they, as if they have lots and lots of responsibility to make things happen. And so it makes it quite difficult for them to give that up or to share it because they feel understandably very fearful of what that might mean. Um, and I think what we've ended up with is a situation where there is a sense that uh, members of a local authority feel as if they might have a responsibility for something they've signed up to, regardless of how perfect or imperfect it is. Um, but in actual fact, it might only be two, three, four, five percent of the overall emissions of that area. All the rest of it is down to the behaviour and actions and initiatives and courage of lots of other people. So it's finding a way in which, as you say, you, it's about distributed leadership, isn't it? And it's about re-understanding those relationships and those roles and responsibilities and saying, we can't do this bit. How do we get over ourselves that we might be quite scared of these noisy activist people on the outside that might have been the very thing that encouraged the declaration in the first place because they might be a bit activist and I know this happens everywhere and understandably how do we all understand each other's roles and, and, and restrictions of that role in such a way that we can build those bridges and I think uh, we're at a really interesting stage now in Cornwall where we're working really hard to build those bridges and to understand the sort of narratives that everybody is in and finding ways in which we can so something collaborative together but I suspect that's happening 
everywhere. It's de definitely down to the people who, who already are, are, are in this area and feel as if they know more or less what's going on um, and people in the community who might be the best possible sort of calling response of getting to all the places that a local authority can't and shouldn't be expected to. So it's understanding those all those different skills that different parts of that wider community have to find the way of you know literally building the path as we're walking on it yeah, yeah if, if i can kind of reflect on that as well because one of the words that i always write down before these sorts of discussions because i know i'm going to say it a lot is scale and um the the scale at which powers um, are, are held the you know scale of kind of kind of geographic scale but also the kind of tiers of local government and tiers of national government um as a town, we're a town of 25,000 people, um, which is a really funny scale. It makes a scale where you kind of go, we've got enough scale that we can do some things collect collectively. But perhaps we're starting to get too big to do things as a whole town. So actually, one of the things that's come out from the um, um, from lockdown has been a whole series of neighborhood networks and neighborhood groups springing up which are really hyper local just three or four streets sometimes just working together to do things that they they need to do to support each other or that they want to do for their very small neighborhood so there's the little scale stuff which adds up to the town then the data side of things that that Simran and Matt were talking about the data is held at a much bigger scale in a lot of cases so if you're a city or a, a county you've got great data on a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily then become available for a town or a parish. And it goes back to, I think, what Simran was saying about, you know, good enough is good enough, you know, getting data that's good enough and not chasing perfect data, just something that's going to give you the right steer to, to get you on a path. Um, so yeah, we, we, we sort of move up and down scales an awful lot. I'm, I'm like a piano player of some sort, bad, a bad piano player. <laughs> I think that's a really, uh, really good point there. The idea of scale that, that is going to be relevant to anyone interested in this in this topic, uh, whether that's individual scale right up to uh, you know global scale. Um, and I wanted to bring in there's some really interesting comments and questions in the chat. Um, a couple of people talking about um, how their own local authority has has not declared, um, and some really interesting comments around. Uh, the term emergency being used or not being used. I think it's really interesting to consider the uh, historical and political connotations of the term emergency. You know, what has that word been used to excuse uh, on a political level, you know, uh, throughout history? You know, it, it, there's, there's a lot wrapped up in that and it being avoided is quite an interesting thing. Um, uh, and there's uh, Nancy made a, a really interesting point about um, councils can act fast, and they have done, um, talking about uh, post-war regeneration or foot and mouth. Uh, and, and I wonder, and this, this is a, a question to all of you, it, it, whether the difference is maybe with COVID or with or something else is that some of these problems feel like complicated problems to which there is a solution. And if councils feel like they understand their role in it, they can act fast. And they can they can they can find a mandate to do something, but for something like the climate emergency, which is a complex problem where there isn't an obvious solution, is is that difference where some of this uh, the, the challenges in responding urgently come up, or or is it something else? What, what, what's the difference between responding to uh, a, a health emergency versus responding to the, the climate emergency? I'm not expecting a, a, a one word answer to that. That's quite a big, big question. But is, is that something we need to consider when we talk about, you know, the type of language that we're using? I'll jump in. I think absolutely right. Just to say, yes, it is uh, an issue or it's a thing. Whether it becomes an issue or not, it's down to us. There's lots and lots of discussion around that in terms of uh, uh, XR members, for example, some people saying, yeah, absolutely, we completely need to red flag this off the roof and set it on fire emergency. Um, and other people saying, oh, it puts, puts people off and shuts people down and everything in between. So I think we do need to consider those words. Uh, I like the idea of a green living plan. Um, I think some people might feel that that sounded really lovely to move towards without the urgency. So that's at the other end of the scale. So it depends entirely. Um, I think just in response to your point about the health we can move really fast when people are going to die now 
but it doesn't seem so great if those people that are dying now are brown and live somewhere else. And I think to some degree as a species, we only tend to respond to the need for change when our toes are literally over the edge of the cliff. And one of the problems around the climate emergency, it is an emergency, it's an existential threat, even with a small e, um, everybody has seen it yet. Um, and so it relies on the sort of Cassandra complex of some people saying, no, it's really, it's really, it's quite bad, really. It's really quite bad and quite now and quite here. Um, and trying to find ways to engage people in that. I'm not sure there's an answer. I think it's understanding that different people will respond to it in different ways. And as all of us tend to be quite ninja and sensitive to engaging as many people as we possibly can and not being too sort of hard line and, and um, inflexible about how we have those conversations. It has to be about talking about it. It has to be about having those conversations. Um, and so we'll need different, different sentence structure for those conversations, won't we, each time. And I think something that we we've found in uh, that I found in, in discussions um, has been that there are people who are put off by the climate emergency rhetoric, the language, the the the, the sort of activist mode. Um, but when you sit and talk practical action, and say, and yeah. I can see a, a comment in the in the chat from Phil about you know cleaning up the local river. When you talk about very practical things that people can do. They're very supportive of those practical actions to make their town a better place, to make local air quality improve, um, even action to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and I was telling a story this morning of a, a, a London borough that shall remain nameless that didn't declare a climate emergency because they couldn't agree the politics of it. But they set themselves a carbon neutral by 2030 target because they could agree that that was something they wanted to try and achieve. So actually, it's like, well, you know, do we shout at them for not declaring a climate emergency or do we support them for saying we want to do this in the way that we can and to an accelerated timetable? So, yeah, I think I think there's ways of many ways of achieving things. And I guess it's that difference between kind of campaigning mode and then delivery mode, if, if those are the right sorts of words to use. Yeah, and, and just, just to come in there, I think... Um, uh, okay, yeah, I know you haven't necessarily said, said this, this this word, but you know the the, the communication, the, the, the comms, the, the the language, and tailoring that to different individuals is is really important. And even before the swathe of climate emergencies, it was it was always it, for some a big turn off to talk in 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 carbon emission terms or climate terms about some of these things and. Um, fast forward a, 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 a year, there was there was one um, council that still felt, you know, yes, they've declared a climate emergency, you know, on the face of it, but there still needs to be a load of um, non-climate benefit that is really, really clear in the action plan that they develop, and and they set us the challenge of not mentioning carbon. Uh, just as a test, I don't think it got published without the word carbon or climate in, but just set up the challenge to say whether we could write a, a climate action plan and just just word it in terms of all the other co-benefits to health, to the economy. And and, and, we, and we, we, we could, across pretty much every sector, you, you could tell a pretty compelling story about why and you know how, how to act um, with, without having climate at the heart of it. So... Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a big part of progressing um, to to the implementation. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I, I, it, it is it is a it is a, a complicated one because every, everyone receives the the climate comms differently. And I say it's, there's there's two ways that comms can be used. One is sort of like a press release. The other one is communication, which is much more reciprocal and mutual. And I think for me, the conversation uh, and that communication, commu communicating and communicationing is actually where the real change can happen. So it's not, so we, we move away from this and sort of transmit to much more reciprocal. And I think one of the presenters yesterday, and I can't remember who it was, but I will do, talked about um, the way in which we 
it might have been math actually was talking about the way in which we get bound up by getting everything and you talked about this as well so I mean, spot on exactly right almost like a fear of getting it wrong or buggering things up and what we need is a direction of travel and good enough now we give it a try and if we're okay with being wrong and we've got really good relationships with everybody that we're working with and we say this might work probably won't so we're going to launch it we're going to do something on monday and then on tuesday let's see if it works and on wednesday let's reconfigure it and on thursday we'll, we'll send out the sort of the second version on friday we'll try that again if we have that sort of response collectively to knowing that it's bound to be wrong immediately but there is that sort of legitimacy and shared faith in that collective endeavor then it means we can try doing stuff and it involves everybody because people then can forward and say oh yeah that was quite good but how how's about if we do it this way and people feel as if they're involved from the beginning somebody said recently um that it, oh i know it was uh, it was newton europe uh, a big newtonian um straight line thinking operation that was talking to Cornwall council about its health system um and i'm not a very good straight line thinker myself at all uh, but I, what they said was, if you've created a plan, and in the plan, you have engagement in it, you've done the plan wrong, because you need to do that engagement at the very beginning and have some element of good enough co-design, doesn't need to be perfect, none of this is going to be perfect, it's going to have to all change anyway, so it needs to be very agile and flexible, but enough people involved at the beginning so that you get a sort of contagious change culture developing and people feel, feel they can participate and can contribute and can point to different ways of doing it and with incredible you know a shared skill set across all the different um, bodies involved that can do things differently and we're all learning how to do that and we've all got structures that don't allow that very well I think we've heard that in all the sessions so far going against the tide on all of this so the way in which we engage it with each other is different has to be different now and the economic metric and paradigm that we are in does not allow for this sort of transformational change. So I think power to the elbow of anybody that's trying to do this. And let's assume we're going to do it not right to begin with. And that's OK, because the will is to try and do it better tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And I think that's what's um, a bit of a challenge when you kind of face it against the time and the urgency that and the scale of money and investment that's needed for some of the larger projects that the willingness to fail on a big retrofit project is really low because you know you've got all that buy and if some if a council yeah. really did do you know really great engagement they are nervous about failing on that project because maybe you only get one or two tries so it's kind of balancing you know the really hard to do stuff with some easier wins to kind of get buy-in and show that like you have a bit of a track record you can implement action you can do change um and what we've found was that you know local authorities that were better at kind of talking about the co-benefits like any benefit that doesn't just talk about emissions reduction we're, um, we're reporting more actions than cities that didn't. And I think that shows that, you know, cities that are talking more about job creation, that are talking about air quality, public health, you know, improved access to nature are doing a bit better just because they've figured out how to communicate better with their different stakeholders to get that buy-in and hopefully are kind of building a little bit more level of trust with the right people as opposed to just everyone in the city you know who are the right people that you need to actually be engaging with thank you so there's some really really interesting um comments coming through in the chat and uh, and responses to to what you've all been saying uh which is which is fantastic um i wanted to to pick up on 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 a couple of things that potentially feel conflicting but I, I think i think there's a lot of nuance in there so one there was a comment about uh, uh council's responsibility responsibility being to lead uh, and that leadership role um but then there's also been uh, comments about the importance of co-design uh, and consultation which i think have been have been echoed here um certainly my experience of working within a, a council is that those two things can sometimes feel quite opposite uh, and, I, and i absolutely don't think that they are but that idea of 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 leadership of of a council kind of taking action and uh, and 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 wielding the power that it has versus the the you know the the, the elements of co design and and what that does to to power um, and, and kind of quite traditional power structures can I think can be a real challenge and a real a real barrier to people and especially when you bring in that idea uh, you know Amanda that you introduced of you know it being okay to get things wrong. 
which is very antithetical to uh, a local authority response, which Simran, you picked up on as well. So um, there, there's a tension, and I'm curious if any of you have seen that done particularly well, that idea of a council understanding its role in terms of, of leadership, where it should lead and where it should follow, um, and, 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 and that idea of co-design being done in a, in a way that is collaborative, but also doesn't pass the buck and doesn't, doesn't involve a council uh, devolving the responsibility that it has. I'm sure there are, there are other examples, but the one that comes to my mind is Bristol City Council. You know, they've got a, um, they call it their one city strategy, but they've essentially come up with, oh gosh, eight or 10 themes. Don't hold me to that. Eight or 10 themes. And, you know, they've um, figured out who are the largest stakeholders and each of those themes are on transport, environment, housing, um, economic development and essentially engage those stakeholders and they call them their boards on a regular basis but then you know the city is still heavily involved in all of those areas they even have like a scientific committee as well that I should disclose I'm part of as well but you know they've really tried to engage all different types of people but showing that they understand that they're responsible at the end of the day but they've put engagement with the right stakeholders at the heart of the strategy to ensure that it actually gets embedded by not only themselves, but then the right people who actually then need to eventually deliver on the action. And I think that's a really great example of a different governance structure. And I think that's eventually what it's gonna require is having local authorities change how they govern and you know what can they kind of put to a different organization, but still hold accountability to that. And that relationship is kind of really tricky because governance is it's a very long conversation as well. <laughs> and that's another area to have to get into, but I think that's important. It is, isn't it? Because it's to do really with um, under, moving away from the presumption which we all hold, even without realising it, that the council is there to lead. And it's not there to lead. It is there by consent, by a social contract. And there are things that it should and it has to lead on. And there are things that it shouldn't and can't lead on. And it's understanding that that leadership is held at different scales, in different ways, in different colours and flavours by different people and finding out how they can all move in sort of an agile way and move backwards and forwards and see what is um, required each time rather than presuming. I don't think the council is able to lead on lots of things for all sorts of institutional, political and financial reasons. And I think it's wrong and unfair of citizens to assume that. I think if it's not leading where it has the ability to and to poke and provoke and to cattle prod the bigger structures, then I think it's failing in its leadership because it has more ability to do that. But then the rest of a community that isn't the council, and there's lots of different component parts, also have huge responsibility and ability mm -hmm. to lead in different ways. And it's just understanding that it's that thing more than that thing, but we have been completely brought up to assume it's that. That's C. It's, the, it's what Marshall McLuhan said, that we don't know who it was that discovered water, but we're pretty sure it wasn't a fish. That you don't see the paradigm that you swim in, and we are absolutely in a paradigm where we think the council needs to do everything. And actually encouraging a council to declare is part of that wider understanding of, by declaring, you can enable this to happen. Oh, and by the way, we're doing this over here and this is our bit and how do we join it all up rather than just seeing it as the one at the top. So it's re-understanding all that. That's a big ask of us all really, isn't it? Um, but I think really, really useful points and, and that kind of, framing of, of how we think about this is still central. Um, there's a couple of um, points here from, from Jonathan, um, who, who brings up the issue of, um, so that there's there's a, a climate emergency declaration, but, but his perception is that there's a lot of the population who, who aren't behind it and, and don't support that. So moving on, Amanda, from what you were saying, and again, touching on this idea of what is the role of the council and, and this idea of leadership, where is that line in terms of if, if the council and those within and working on it have access to this data and they and they believe that no this is an emergency and, and the implications of this are going to be incredibly detrimental how much effort needs to be put into communicating that and bringing people along so that the you know the majority of what is effectively or, or you know a, a democratic process believe in that uh, and see that as a priority versus taking urgent action um, and building, uh, you know, building decisions 
into uh, into what it, what has been done you know the whole premise of, of of democracy rests on 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 that tension there of of it not just be resting on one person within a council deciding that this thing is important no matter how how much evidence they might have to back that up um so how do how do we balance those those roles and or, or, or the dynamic of what a council is now and maybe this this touches on um you know something similar you were talking about in terms of governance of, of where where councils need need to get to um i wonder lizzie you know in, in Froome, has, has that been an issue at all that idea of, of of having to bring people along the council playing a role in that i think it's um it's a really interesting one and i think that you Froome is an unusual town council which many of you will have hopefully um heard about and and, and seen um, and talked talked with before um, we have a very strong commitment the town council has a very strong commitment to to um, engaging with the community as often as we can on as many different things as we can um, and trying to make sure that we're not just talking to the same people across the same table or zoom virtual table um, every single time and that's the consistent challenge for us is how do we talk to the people that that don't necessarily come forward to engage on a, on a topic. Um, I think there is, there's a certain element of sort of you know, passionately wanting people to sort of get this and to see that, that the climate emergency is a real challenge. It's something, it's the biggest thing we're facing as, as a, a, a species, as a planet, um, and really kind of wanting to, to just go, surely you can see this. And then an element of like, I'm not a public information film. Um, you know, David Attenborough did us a wonderful job, has always done us a wonderful job. But, you know, the, the uptick in um, awareness around plastics, for example, a couple of years ago when, when um, his documentaries around ocean life came out, you could see, you know, there was an uptick in awareness of the issue, recognition that all of us were causing it, um, and changes in behavior and plastic free movements, all that sort of stuff really came through and then dropped off again. And so for me, the challenge is partly, you know, how do we, who are the, who are the voices that people will listen to? If the council tells you to do something, really, are you going to do it? Generally, it's like, oh no, it's the council. <laughs> Look at them telling me what to do. How dare they? So who are the messengers? And how are they bringing those messages across? And who, who do people listen to? People listen to their peers, their friends, their family, their neighbours, um, celebrities, trusted newscasters. Um, they don't necessarily listen to or particularly trust politicians, um, corporations, a lot of corporations, energy companies, you know, a lot of those messengers um, at, at the moment. So so I think there's something in there about who whose message it is and who the messengers are. I think on the leadership side of things, absolutely, I think we're in that world and we, we need to not be in that world. Um, and a big part of what we're trying to do in Froome is to kind of cut through a lot of that. But there's always the challenge, and this is the dynamic. We, we've had sort of discussions as a relatively new group of councillors in the last election. There were 13 of us who've never done this before. And we had the discussions of like, well, do we go out and we should go out and consult people? about what they want and other people other councillors are saying well they elected us so they've told us what they want because it was in our little leaflet that we did it's like uh, and trying constantly to just question that and to think what can we do with executive authority almost and what should we actually be talking to people about more and helping co-designer to shape and actually what different directions do people want us to go in as time passes um i'm not sure if that's answered your question sorry <laughs> reflections really, philosophizing really, on a, really, on a really, really important though isn't it because it's about into my mind all due respect to peter this particular council but local authorities are rubbish at public engagement <laughs> um, and i don't want to be publicly engaged um but they're really really good at some other things so it's about figuring out well you know if, if, if a, a council officer i remember stands in front of me in a village hall and tries to tell me about climate change I will have a great deal of difficulty not eating the furniture in frustration. But if they said, how do we, there's loads of things that they know that I don't, I can talk about climate change. So how do we work together so that I can do that bit and find a way of, as you say, creating a space where the people that can do that bit 
can be able to go out and do it. But also then maybe it's not even talking about climate change. If you look at, we've got some fantastic local climate action groups in Cornwall, as I'm sure there are everywhere else that are doing amazing things and they haven't got climate in the title. It might be about food, it might be about um, repair, it might be about community housing, it might be about transport, it might be about socialising or eating together. But all the health stuff that's good for people, sort of psychologically and physically and emotionally, is probably going to be good for the climate and ecological crisis as well. So find things and places where people can get to grips with stuff that's important to them, because the chances are it's going to be delivering on your climate tick box as well. So go to where the people and the energy is rather than arrive with a leaflet saying you must understand this because none of us respond to that very well. I wouldn't and I'm sure other people wouldn't. It's about yeah going to where it is, going to where the energy is and enabling that energy to do the I think the councils often are seen as like the parent who says no. Yeah. And and the community projects and community groups yeah. come forward and say, can I do that? I want to do this. I want to try this thing. And that's horrible for say, oh, no, no, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't touch yeah. that. Yeah. And and actually we need to be maybe the parent who says, Yeah, go for it. Try it out. See what yeah. happens. Yeah. How can we help? Yeah. Douglas they, Rushkoff once said, um, uh, sorry, he said, go find the others, then find the other others. Because find the people that you can work with and then figure out how you build a bridge with another group that you might have nothing in common with. And I thought, oh, yeah, I like that. It's finding new languages, isn't it? And I think on that point, like the people who are most, you know, who are not benefiting from the society that we live in right now are actually the ones that are not engaged through the traditional means that we kind of know them through. So, you know, BAME communities are not engaging in different ways. A lot of people during COVID have actually lost their jobs. So how do you actually engage them? Why would they come to your meeting about climate change when actually their priority is something else? You know, and people have actually taken ill through all this whole process. So really kind of figuring out how do you tap into those communities and those areas? And it's through air through means you probably don't even know and don't even engage in with yourself. So it really does take quite a bit of effort to kind of go beyond your norm and your comfort zone to find the right people that are, and find the right language to engage those people because they want jobs, they want a healthier life, they also want access to nature and all of those things. So how do you make sure that we're not just create, recreating a place that just benefits the wealthy, rich people again? Um, how do we actually then make a more equitable society? And I think that's really, you know, requires a bit of a different tactic and, you know, um, talking differently, engaging different community leaders and really empowering different people in communities that you may have not brought to the table originally. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. And um, so we're coming towards the end. So I want to start moving towards, you know, what, what happens now? Where do, where do we go from here? Um, for anyone that's interested, we can we can quite easily set up a follow on session um, with with anyone who's got time to to stick around uh, and and have a bit more of an open discussion. But um, uh, so Fanny and Roxy have have brought up some really interesting points, echoing um, uh, um, what what you were talking about, Simran and and Manda and and, and well, in fact all of you around um, uh, you know around wealth and around um, uh, equity. Um, so I, I wanted to share so. Roxy also mentioned something that we've been doing in Cornwall around the building on the donor economics work uh, um, at Kate Rayworth's uh, model. So, um, again, as as Amanda talked about, Cornwall's climate emergency declaration being built on a lot of uh, you know um, passionate campaigning. Uh, so too was uh, the the adoption of of the donor economics model to uh, to use uh, within Cornwall Council. Every decision since September last year has at, at, at cabinet level has gone through an, an adapted version of the donor economics uh, model which looks at okay so what are the uh, uh, environmental and social impacts of this decision uh, and, and it's a you know it's, it's a start it's a fairly small um start but it, it's 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 inviting uh, decision makers to look at the the um the more systemic and wider impacts of the decisions they are making and it's not a measurement tool it's not absolute it doesn't tell you what the right decision is but it starts getting into this territory of there are going to be negative outcomes to pretty much any decision that the council makes. Uh, uh, and that can be a paralyzing thing for councils to experience. But if there is a tool that can demonstrate, yet yeah, we foresee uh, a short term or small negative impact in this area, but we believe it's outweighed by the positive impacts in, in these areas. And we've certainly seen that starting to give 
uh, to give councillors and council staff a tool to uh, um, to to be transparent about the decisions that are being made. As with any tool, it's only as good as the people that use it. So there's there's obviously you know there's there's work to be done, um, but it's it's small steps on, on that journey of uh, of making these um, making transparent decisions that acknowledge the complexity. Uh, of the climate emergency and how how equity uh, and health and all of these things are really really tied up in it. Um, so in the last few minutes we've got left, uh, um, and before we wrap up, I'd love to hear any other um, you know examples of of, of, of different you know, different ideas that are being adapted uh, and, and used in in a local authority setting um to to address this so you know i'm sure we can all think of great solutions around renewable energy and things like that that, that will that will get us to where we need to be but but we need new ideas you know new paradigms uh, as, as you've all touched on so uh yeah have any of you seen anything like that or or or, or any ideas of 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 certain types of paradigms we need to change for me, I think there's just more more a word you, you mentioned there, Peter, um, that I don't think it'd be mentioned so far of, of, of transparency. I think that that cuts across quite a lot uh, that we've talked about today. So, you know, whether it's what I was on about at the start around specific activities around strategy or baselining through to governance and how you, a council might go about convening. And, and play into their strengths and weaknesses from an engagement. I think tra transparency is is just something that is is really critical um, across across all of across all of it. And um, yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, just your mention of it then has, has, has just sort of prompted that as a, as a bit of a summary a summary thought. And, and some some are, I know um, uh, one recent example, Warwick uh, Council we were speaking to the other week have got a great portal now set up for citizens to, to continue that dialogue um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure there's other, other examples out there but yeah, transparency I think is is a really important uh, principle uh, to, to all of this. Um, thank you Matt. We've got um, three minutes left um, and as I said very happy to, to set up a, a follow-on conversation in the settings thing after this but we do need to finish on time so the next uh, next conversations can keep going. Um, I'd love to invite all of you to to share one more thing you know anything you want to share that you haven't been able to yet and uh, and if you want to do any kind of plug for how people can find out more about you and the work that you're doing. Uh, so whoever would like to, to go first if you want to jump in. I'll, I'll dive head first. Um, what to share? What have I said? Um, I think, I guess it's maybe this is just the moment for kind of um, reassurance and the, the person when you're 14 miles into a marathon for anybody who ever has, I haven't, but somebody at the side of the road with a sign with your name on saying, keep going. That's, that's the mode. It's, a lot of us will have been working in this sector or this space and campaigning on these issues for a very long time and progress comes in little waves and then it recedes and then it comes again and then it recedes and it can feel thankless and it can feel quite lonely um, and I think that's often the case. We, we had a webinar this morning um, with um, 30 people from different parish councils all talking about what parishes are doing and you can be the only person doing this in your organization or your institution or even your community and you're not the only person doing this um events like this are a great showcase for the fact we're all kind of there are so many people participating now in, in these conversations um things won't always move forward in a linear neat route from a to b but the squiggly line of the journey that takes you from a to c to d and brown to b and probably back to a again is quite fun if you let it be um so yeah it's the reassurance of keep going <laughs> please keep going don't give up and i'm talking to myself as much as to anybody else but no do keep do keep going because we're, we're we're doing the right things for the right reasons i believe and and that that's powerful thank you lizzie i'll jump in after lizzie saying absolutely spot on it's about there's a big issue about permission about people not feeling as if they have permission to disrupt or challenge uh, a lot of our work is around the notion of uh, positive deviance and creative disruption that doesn't mean 
gluing your face to things or breaking things down. It's just about the ability to challenge the status quo. So yeah, absolutely keep going. Absolutely keep talking to yourself. I think it's a very good sign. Um, and uh, you can see a little bit more about what we're doing at kathydisruptive.com to find out why we find these big ideas so tricky and why we make sure we don't feel quite so alone when we're the only one in the room that's saying, yeah, what about, what about, what about? So yeah, I would agree entirely with Lizzie on all of those things. Found it. Um, I guess just as a closing point, you know, it's still amazing work that local authorities are doing with, you know, the limited resources that they have and people and staff, it all comes down to that. Um, but I think a quote that I heard this week was that, you know, le real leadership and real leaders create more leaders, not followers. And I think that really has resonated with me recently that, you know, real councils and people who are actually leading will help inspire others to kind of lead in their own areas and not just create people who are just going to follow along but will empower them to also do other work so I think if you kind of aim for that aspiration that you know you lead yourself but help others also kind of go on the journey because it's a different kind of future that we want we don't actually want winners and losers anymore we want all of us to win or we all lose so it's a different way of having to think about it so um, yeah it's just really great work everyone and thank you for this discussion and uh, over to you Matt yeah, just just I guess a more closing thanks. I think um, yeah, to to to, to where I started. I think just keep keep learning as well as leading, learning learning from others. Um, as, as people have demonstrated on on this in the session, there's, there's so much to learn uh, about and great great things going on. Um, and yeah, I'll just just encourage more more of that. And I guess a shame, shameless plug uh, to, to check out the Anthesis website if, if there's anything um, that people want to specifically follow up with me about. But um, yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you all so much, and thanks to everyone uh, listening. Um, uh, I think there's, there's time for you to uh, head over to the other sessions now. As I say, I'm going to set up a, a breakout space in the sessions group for this uh, for this conversation. If anybody wants to join, um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Some really interesting stuff, uh, and thanks for joining. And, and thanks again to Stir. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.